All right, so this week, week six, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about debu debugging. I, I think, um, I'm sure you've had to do it already. <laughs> and so there are some techniques that uh, are often followed in attempting. Debugging is difficult, right? Let's just get that out of the way. We'll see with that first. Uh, it, it's tough, particularly if, if you want, you have a, a logic uh, error rather than a syntax error. So a syntax error is you've done something that doesn't make any sense to the interpreter. Uh, the interpreter, it's it's like uh, in, in the middle of an English sentence, you start speaking German or something and uh, it just doesn't make any sense, right? So right off the bat, I could say in that sentence, this doesn't make any sense, just stop right here. Right? That's a syntax error. You, you've, you've messed something up um, with your in your communication to the, to the interpreter those are easy to easier to find because the interpreter does complain right it, it throws an error and says i don't know i don't know what you're doing logic errors are much more um, insidious they're oftentimes they there are things that you just haven't properly calculated but there isn't anything wrong with the way you have calculated. So an easy way to make an example of that, which I'll show uh, as we as I move into the example that I'm gonna run, would be if you meant to sum two numbers together, but accidentally you, you, you when you were typing in the, the formula that, you're, that you, you want executed, instead of uh, using the plus sign, you inadvertently, accidentally used the minus sign. Well, there, there isn't anything inherently wrong with with subtracting two numbers so the the interpreter is not going to complain about that right it's not a syntax error but it's not what you meant and you're going to get an incorrect answer right because it was supposed to be summed not uh, subtracted um so that's a, an example a super simple example of a logic error or the use of the equals equals uh, or or rather what what normally happens there is you, you wind up using an equal sign when you meant to use equals equals Right, so you're looking for equivalence, but use the assignment operator, right? And so there isn't anything wrong with that syntactically, but it's it's not going to have the desired results. So that's a logic error, and these are these are difficult to find. So we've got to find some way to or or, or some technique that maybe we can use to kind of hash this out. Uh, number one, you got to find it, right? Even finding where it is is difficult. And um, so let's look at some ways to, to go about that are commonly um, used to go about trying to find these errors and correct them. Because it's, a lot of times the, the solution is, is easy, but the finding of the error is very difficult, <laughs> right? Because there's nothing wrong with it, but syntactically, there's nothing wrong with it. So let's first start off with, um, let me see what I'm, we're going to look at the, I've already set us up with an equation here from this week's uh, reading in chapter six. I'm going to use this distance equation right there that I just blacked out. There we go. We're going to, I'm going to, I already have the code put together. It's in, it's down below uh, the code is, but so we're starting with this equation. I think everyone has seen this equation. It's um, something that you would have seen in physics, probably, if not math, one of your math classes. So what we want to do is is get the difference in the so we have a some coordinate point two coordinate points on on a, uh, two points on a coordinate plane i think that's the way i want to say that so we want to get the difference between the x values of the coordinate points and the difference between the y values of the coordinate points in each case we want to square those differences so the square the differences and then we want to once we have those two squares we want to add those together and take the square root of that final sum in there. So we, we're working from the inside out, where square root will be the last thing we do, right? Once we have finally gotten this sum. And so I'll just jump right to Thani now, where I've already put this together. Um, here's Thani. And let's kind of go through that code, and then let's produce some of these errors. So here's the formula. I've created a, a function to handle this formula. So this is the function, of course. It's called, I didn't create it, it's in the text there. It, this function's called distance, and it takes four parameters. 
the x and y values of the first coordinate uh, point on the coordinate plane, the x and y values of the second point on the coordinate plane. So four in all. All right, and then here's where we're going to get the difference between the x's and the difference between the sums. So it's the dx, or you might say delta x, the difference of the x's, x values, and the difference of the y values. Now we're going to need to square those, right? So dx, we need dx squared. So there's a number of ways to do it, but when you're squaring something, it is just the, that thing, whatever it is you're squaring, times itself. So that's a super simple way to get the square of something, right? And so that's the square of the difference of the x's. Let's, let's jump back to the equation. So in case, so make sure we haven't forgotten what the equation looks like. Oops, that's me. There's the equation. So there's the difference of the x's, and it's going to be squared, right? And so we're going to do the same thing with the y's. We're going to get the different, the D, that'd be what we're calling now dy. This difference of the y's we're storing in the variable called dy. So we, then we're going to want to have dy times dy, right? And then we're going to want to sum those things together. So if I have dx times dx plus dy times dy, we know the times will happen first, the multiplication, according to Aunt Sally, and also inherent in the system. So the, the multiplication will happen first of the left and right operands of the sum, right? And so then we'll just add those two together. Back to Donnie here. So we, we know we have our difference of x's, our difference of y's. We, here's where we square them, the x and the y, uh, the x's, and we square the y's, and we sum those two together. Oh, I thought I could highlight that, but no. Oh, wait a minute. I'm looking at the wrong screen. There we go. That's why I couldn't highlight it. So there we have the difference of the x's, the difference of the y's. There's the difference of the x's squared. That multiplication, according to Aunt Sally, has to happen before this, right? This, this is the dy's squared. dy times dy is dy squared. Right, and then so we would have, in order to perform this, we're going to need to know the two operands, which we now do know. We multi we add them together, and we have d squared, a variable that's just called d squared here. Maybe we could come up with a better name. I don't know. The sum of d squared, the the sum of d's squared. Right, <laughs> whatever. All right, now to get the square root, we're gonna we want the square root of d squared. To get the square root, we're just going to raise it to the, well, 0.5 is the, what we're calling it here, but it's one half, right? So, and this is the case, this is just a mathematical uh, rule that if you're trying to take the root of something, um, it's the, the the inverse of, so if it's, the, if it's the cube root, it would be raised to the one third, right? If we just... The, the exponential version of the, the square root, they're, they're synonyms, right? If we want the fourth root, then we would raise to the one-fourth. So a raise to the point two five. I could do that. And we know that the operator for raising to an exponent, exponent operator, is star star. Okay? So we this is us raised, our square square root of, because we're, we're, uh, we're, we're um, the exponent is 0.5, which is one half. Okay, so the square, which would be a two, invert that one half. So we've we've put the square root then in a variable here that lives inside of this function, right? That's important to know as well. All of these variables, I'll I'll speak of that in a second here. Let's finish with the with walking through this equation. So now this is the square in results, the square root is in result. And we want to return that value, right? This chapter is calling these kinds of functions that have a return value um, fruitful functions. I've only, I've never heard that before, except in this in this text. So, uh, but whatever, that's how it fits into the title of the text. And we know the function's over because the indentation has stopped right here. 
So this is it. So once we hit, um, and we know it's over because we have a return there, right? The minute we hit that return, if we move this line six between line three and four, so it became line four, that it would return right there. We would never get to these other calculations. So we know the function's over right here from, in multiple ways. We hit the return and the indentation stopped. All right, so for two reasons, we know it's done. <laughs> All right, and so, um, yeah, uh, these variables in here, let's, let's speak to that real quick. All of them, including the x1, y1, x2, y2, d squared is a variable that was declared inside this function, right? And result is the variable that was created right here inside the function. So this has what's called scope, like where can we see this variable in, this, in our programming, in our whole screen. Well, we can only see those variables inside the scope and where it, where it is. So inside this function, they're local to this function. They belong to this function. If I tried to print down here, instead of what I have here, uh, but if I just tried to print dx outside of that function, down here if I made line 9, and I said I print dx, uh, I'm going to get an error because it's not, we can't see that, fun, that that variable outside of that function. Okay, it's local to that function. That's one thing to, and result to, you know, all of them are all the same in here. All the parameters, once we're inside, anything else that we declare inside of this function, which are these two, we can't see any of it. And there was something else I was going to say. Those are local. Any variable that we declare outside of here, we can see inside of the function because it's it's further out, right? The more we dig in, kind of think of the functions as parentheses. We can't see out of the parentheses, but we can see out of the pencher to a higher level, to a higher scope, but we can't see into the parentheses from a, from a higher scope. Right, so this is higher out. This is calling each of these functions. There could be multiple functions, right? I would define all of them before I get going on the actual program, which started here in this case on line eight. I personally would call this my main program, here. any lines that I have from eight and beyond. Now we only have one line of code in this program in main. All right, so what will happen is when the interpreter starts up, and we're going to see this in a second, it will start, the interpreter will start up here on line one. It'll start reading, but because this is a definition, it's not going to execute this code, right? It's just incorporating this code uh, and this namespace right here into the language. So this is a user-defined function. So now this is a part of the language, right? So if we ever use this word, distance, down here at line eight and beyond, as I've done right here, then it it has it's it's, it's valid, right? That the the interpreter knows what that means at that point. But had we not done the definition, the interpreter would not know what it means because it doesn't exist in the language, right? This is a user defined function. So the interpreter will read all the functions first, but they will not execute. At some point, they have to be called to execute. And so this is a call right here. Here's a call to distance. It's inside, it's nested inside the print um, method, right? So I, in order to figure out what I have to print, I first have to do what's inside of this method, right? Which is a call to distance. So this highlighted area, you can think of it after the call as whatever the result is that got returned, which happens to be the word result. So if it returns some result of, let's say, 25, then um, this highlighted area right there, you can think of it safely. Think of it as it's just 25. It's, the, it's, it's replaced with the integer 25, whatever got returned. Right? So we're printing 25. And if we ran this, we'll see if it will work. just to prove that it works all right so there's no errors in this program and 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 so these were these values were chosen so that um it's just a standard sequence or pattern that we all that that's well known um 
it's a three, four, five triangle here. So if we have a three and a four, so we want this. If dx is three and dy is four, then result will be five. Okay, that doesn't work for all numbers, just three, four, five. It's not gonna be like five, six, seven. That won't work. We just know that three, four, five does work. And so I've chosen, or they've chosen, and I, I too would have chosen, this sequence of numbers so that I can get a three, four, and I expect a five, as I got. Right. So I kind of want to, we want to verify it. I mean, remember, the machine doesn't know how to do this. So this is, if we make a mistake, then it, it's on us if it doesn't come back as, as, as five, right? Then we've done something wrong. The machine doesn't think. All right, but now... What can we say about something here? An example of a syntax error. Say, I called a function that I believed existed that's named and with the letters D-I-S-T-A-N-C-E yet the definite that's not been defined right and you're going to see down here name error this this thing is not defined right and it's because i misspelled it and right? so i defined a different function one that has a different name so this is an example of a syntax error right we get this error message let's see if i can just do it control z yeah all right so that's fixed again Here's an example of a logic error. Wait a minute, I hit the wrong button there. There we go. Uh, uh, still messed it up. There. Okay. This is a logic error. There's not going to be, it's, it's not going to throw an error here, right? The interpreter won't. Because there's nothing wrong with saying x2 plus x1. It's just not the formula. <laughs> so this is a logic error, and, and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to get the wrong answer here, right? This is not what it, I'm expecting a 5. I'm expecting to get a 5 back because I know that I sent a 3 and a 4 for the difference of the x's and the difference of the y. So I expect a 5. I don't get it. How do I find this? So I wouldn't have intentionally set this up. I accidentally or inadvertently did that. That I added that plus sign. <coughs> So one way that's commonly used to try and locate these problems, first off, you've got to you've got to understand that there's a problem, right? So you need to work it out by hand first, so you know the answer, and you're just verifying, right? You're verifying your own code. It's what you're really doing to ensure that there aren't any logic errors. So one common technique is to just jump in here after line two i'll create a new line to put a print in there right and i'll just print the value of dx and i'll print underneath of line three here i'll print the value of dy and then i'll print d squared and i might just do them one at a time i do the first because maybe i'll come upon it and not have to write all these prints in there right? and i would have right as soon as i print I, I did a print underneath uh, uh line two if i printed dx then I would recognize that dx that's printing from my program is not um, what dx should be. It's not three, right? And it should be three. So there, it would it would help me locate. So then I'd be thinking, well, what's wrong with line two then? And then, of course, we ultimately get to. Oh my gosh, I pushed the plus sign instead of the minus right and i say that these kinds of errors are insidious because sometimes it, it, you could spend hours trying to find something so small as this it really is truly oftentimes a needle in a haystack trying to find these logic errors like this so there we we fixed it using prints i didn't actually type them in there but you know what i would do oh i'd also like to comment that i hope everyone at this point is comfortable with the fact that this is the call to the function and that's what causes um, this code to execute okay, the function to execute 
as we'll see in a second here, that the compiler does look at it and incorporate it into the language, but it does not execute this code until this call is made, right, in our main. All right, so using prints is a very commonly used technique. Sometimes a lot, a lot of times what you might want to do too is like put a hash mark in front of things so you can comment it out so it's not executing when something's broken. <clears throat> and as you back up, sometimes if, if, you, if you can just back out of some of your calculations, that can be very helpful too. I mean, there's no cut and dry way to say this way always works or that way. It's just whatever happens to fit at the time that you're, you're, you're working on it. Um, so you might, it might be useful to comment out some code, make your code a smaller base, right? Which kind of brings the point, maybe, maybe you shouldn't make it so big in the first place anyway, right? The, the less lines you have written before you verify, the better. Because <laughs> you don't want to have 10,000 lines of code, and then somewhere in that 10,000 lines of code, there's been a minus sign that inadvertently got switched to a plus, you know, typed in a plus instead of a minus. Right? You have a harder time finding that. If you'd only had two, three lines of code, you'd find that quickly. So we really want to run often, right? We want to write a bit of code, test it. Write a bit of code, test it, and try to just cycle through like with that, with that, um, with that pattern. Another way to work with um, to, to debug programs is to use a debugger, what's called a debugger. And here in Thani, we do have a debugger. It's right here. So this one is equivalent to the button that we keep using here, the play button. So now I'm going to debug it, though. I'm going to use the next one down, which will be a control F5. And as it fires up here. So this is the debugger going through our code. And so it's here it is incorporating the definition into the language All right so now this exists so i have a couple of buttons up here that i can now work with this last one here says oh just go ahead and, and run as usual all right so that's not too useful for a debugging but if you happen to notice the mistake you're making um you, you might just say okay just forget it or just stop right and we've got a step into a step over Oh, sorry, I went on backwards. Step over, that's step over, step into, and step out. So if you're inside, this will get you into a function, this will get you out of the function, and this will just jump a line of code. It'll just, well, it'll execute the code, but it won't go into anything. So that's what we're going to use right now, step over. I'm just saying here, just go one more line. So now we're on this line. So nothing executed there, right? Nothing came out down here. You say, well, it's just defining it. Now, at this point, I expect to see an execution happen at some point because we need to get into this function needs to, to get executed. So I could step in and I'm going to step into. Oh, I stepped over. Sorry. So that means I finished the program. Let's just do it again. There it is. Okay. I'm going to step over this one, but I'm going to step into this one, this one. So it's about to step into this print. And what we see, first place it has to go when it steps into this function call called print is another function call called distance with all of those uh, parameters, one, two, four, six. So I'll step into it again, but it's going to go through the parameters here. All right. And then. I've through all of, I've looked at all of those. Now we're about to execute that call right there. Now this step in is going to put me into the function definition. It's not really the definition now though. It's the execution, right? Because I'm it, it came from a call. But here's the beauty of it. So we're sitting on this line. This is the next line that's going to execute, and I can see the variable names x1 and x2 and the values that are in those variables. So x1 and x2 which are right here, it must have been a 1 and a 4 came in for those variables. And so if I step, oh, well, if I step into, now I'm stepping into the execution of the right-hand side. So I can see the variables changing there, and finally the, 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 uh, 
the evaluation is 3, which is going to get assigned to dx. And if we look down here, we see dx has a 3 in it now. And then I can just go through all of this like that. I'm going to step over that one so we don't go through the whole thing anymore. But you see now dy has a 4 in it. That's expected, right? That, that's why we set the particular parameters so that we would have 3, 4 in, in x and y. And now let's see what's going to happen with this. I'll step into this. And you see it's going to be 3 times 3. Okay. 4 times 4. 16. And now we're going to do the sum. And it's 25 that's going to go into d squared, right? And then uh, we see down here, d squared has a 25 in it. So I can, I can step through this whole program like that. And any, any programs. I'm just going to step over at this point. So we see d squared is 25. I don't see dx. Let me step over. And we're back to... Oh, and here we... Right? And so, just as I had mentioned... That, that call, that function call that we had written there, distance with, with those parameters, 1, 2, 4, 6, it just gets replaced with the return value. So we're just going to print 5. That's what's about to happen next. And there, print 5 at the bottom. So I would encourage you to play with these uh, with this debugger a little bit. Um, to get kind of comfortable with it so that um, because it's very helpful right and as I'm as I mentioned it, it debugging in my opinion debugging is one of the hardest things potentially one of the hardest things to do when you're when you're programming because these these errors can be very hard to find and a debugger really helps to to locate those errors but you you still do have to know what your values are supposed to be Right, and you can't fall into the trap of thinking that um, somehow the computer should know what what this should be. It, it doesn't know anything, right? You got to keep that in mind at all times. It's just a machine. All right, and I think there's some other reading in this section, um, but it's it is all pretty straightforward, and uh, this I think is the most important part of, of what's in this whole chapter here. Um, there's some. Some interesting techniques there, composition um, or decomposition, however we look at it, which would mean nothing more than um, we can break a function into functions. And, and this, we, this is desirable because we, we do like functions to be as simple as possible. We, we want them to do as little as possible individually, right? So we could create a function. If we go back, to, let me go back to Fani. We could create a function here that could... Um, maybe calculate d squared independently or it could do uh, well the difference is pretty easy right I would do d squared so in another function we may receive four variable for um, it's gonna look a lot like distance it's gonna receive four parameters x1 y1 x2 y2 and it's going to perform this calculation, but return R squared, not result. Right? This is the notion. I don't know why we would do this in this case, but this is the idea of composition. Uh, well, it's called composition as an overall concept. That functions are composed of other functions. Uh, so what we're doing here is decomposing. We're breaking this function into smaller functions. So I've now have in this notion. I have two functions, one called distance and another one we're going to call d squared, I guess, or something like that. And I would replace this code with a call to dx. Right, and, and dx will return, it's going to kind of look like that, right, except it'll be or d squared. It'd be d squared with a paren. So now I can't use the same name or I'm going to have a function name that's the same as a variable name and that's not going to work. But I think you get the idea here and this will become more and more uh, uh, 
useful and obviously useful as the functions get larger, right? If it's a really complex function, I might want to break this into its parts or into some parts, and then I can reuse those parts and I'll just make the call to each individual part from the function, it's from the main function itself. All right, so this, this works because functions can call functions and everything really is a function. This is the main, I call this the main function and all lines from E on if we had more lines of code there. So hopefully that all makes sense. That's the, the main, that's one main thing. They also discuss in the text uh, a little, little bit of having to do with um, unit testing. Um, I see down there. Uh, it's just a, a technique. It's composite this, everything we just did. Boolean structures, yeah. Well, we can return a true or false just like we can return an int or a double. We can return any type we want. Um, unit testing, uh, this is 6.7. Uh, there's, there's, there's oftentimes with equations certain um, particular elements or, 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 or particular integers that may not be in uh, the solution set or, or the domain, I should say. Um, the domain may not include, let's say, zero. Right, so you can't you can't plug zero in. So you'd want a unit test to test everything below zero or some number below value below zero, a value above zero, and a test of zero. What happens when someone types a zero in here? Do I have a, a way to handle that? All right, so unit tests are are just uh, nothing more than a, a an organization of of what kind of tests should I be running here to make sure that this I'm not going to inadvertently uh, fall into some other sort of error because maybe somebody typed in a Q when they were supposed to put a, an integer in right and I'm, I'm sending a string and I'm supposed to send an integer can I handle that is my code handling that so we would have unit tests that could um, just summarize all of those possible problems that could occur and, and, and ensure that we can handle the whole domain if we're talking about integers and that we can handle people typing erroneously into um, if there's an input in, into our program so um, you can look through that it is a very organized way to, um, to 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 ensure that your program is is working well right? and then you just go through with each unit test and you just make sure that it does what you're supposed to do and if not you know okay it's not handling division by zero properly or something like that right it's not handling a value that's outside of the domain properly. So I've, you know, I've not defined the domain properly. All right. So you might want to look through that because it, it is helpful. It is helpful in, in verifying and being able to verify that your program actually works properly in all cases. It may, it may operate properly in some cases, but then not others, right? So we want to, if there are distinct possible scenarios that could happen, we, we'd like to test those. Alright, so I'm going to let this one go at this point and you guys will let me know if there are any problems moving forward. Alrighty, I will see you next time.